So before I get started here, I'm so excited to see so many people from the gym current. Um, I see a lot of alumni around here as well. Thank you, we've been thinking about you <laughs> an awful lot. And then there's some people I don't recognize at all. <laughs> so thanks for coming out. Uh, so, so for those that have never met be me before, I am Tom. Uh, I'm one of the co-owners with Errol here at Rocky Point. And, uh, and I do some coaching and stuff like that as well. So we ready to roll here? All right, let's get cracking here, shall we? Where's that music coming from? <laughs> oh, good. Good. We're, we're just about to launch, Dustin. And it's like, no, something's bugging me. You weren't here yet. There was a small disturbance. <laughs> Thanks, Arya. All right. Okay. It's go time. <laughs> All right, here we go. It's late at night. And for whatever reason, you are unable to sleep. <laughs> Is this going to be that kind of talk? <laughs> it's late at night, and for whatever reason, you can't sleep. So you decide to gently get out of bed and head on down to the living room, and you're going to turn on the TV. You start flipping around the channels, and it's only natural that you settle on the paid for programming channel, because you need to get caught up on the latest made for TV products and services. The following pitch comes on. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, we found it. Years after Ponce de Leon gave up his search for the fountain of youth, researchers have cracked the code and have developed a radical new treatment that will make you younger. This revolutionary, revolutionary new treatment promises to improve your memory, increase your creativity. You will look younger, you will be more attractive. Your chances of cancer, dementia will be dramatically reduced. Also, your chances of a heart attack, stroke, and did I mention diabetes? They will be dramatically reduced as well. Cold and flu? Forget about it. You'll be happier, less anxious, less depressed, and your confidence will soar to unimaginable levels. Ladies and gentlemen, are you interested? I said, are you interested? Yeah. <laughs> well, of course you are. But as you're fumbling for your phone and your credit card, expecting a shipment of supplements and tonics and lotions and electrode wigs, the camera pans over to Coach Aaron as he's standing there with an expression like this on his face. And if you've been to any of his Saturday morning classes, you know what's coming next. Oh shit, the treatment is burpees! And you start trying to change the channel as quickly as you can. So of course, fitness is one of those key lifestyle habits that everybody needs to incorporate into their lives in order to find that fountain of youth. But there are a number of other lifestyle habits that we all need to be working on as well in order to increase our probabilities of that quality longevity. I just had them up here on the screen if you're paying attention, worked into our logo. I need your help. What are those key lifestyle habits that we should be working on? Shout them out. Fitness, nutrition, sleep. Excellent, fitness, nutrition, sleep, what else? Thank you. Burpees, yeah. <laughs> we pretty much got them all there, guys. So yeah, on, on our list, we have sleep, fitness, nutrition and hydration, mindfulness and stress management, social connection, which is huge, and I've also included another one here, alcohol cessation. <laughs> so you might be wondering, well, why don't you have quit smoking on the list, right? So in my 46, half, 46 and a half years on the planet, I've been able to bear witness to a societal paradigm shift. When I was a kid, you would go into a restaurant with mom and dad, and it was somebody's job to say smoking or non-smoking. Well, we've got the grandparents with us, so smoking, please. Um, <laughs> you'd go to Tim Hortons, and the air would literally be blue with smoke. People could smoke on airplanes, for crying out loud. So it is my sincere hope that in my, my remaining life on this planet, I will again get to witness that same paradigm shift 
that we experience with smoking, but with this list right here as well. So 10 years ago, I felt myself being on a slippery slope. I felt myself older than my biological age. Um, I was overweight, I was sedentary, and I was like, man, I gotta do something about this. So I took control of it and I figured out fitness, fitness. That's the thing I'm gonna focus on to improve my life. And lo and behold, it really improved my life. Every aspect of my life has been better as a result. So when I started a CrossFit affiliate, it was like, fitness, fitness is the tool that I shall wield and the world will become a better place. And of course, yeah, fitness really does have its place in all this. But after watching thousands upon thousands of hours of you folks working out in here and having a genuine interest on what can we do here at Rocky Point to be a better service to our members, we started to really start going down the rabbit hole and study and research and research. And what I've really come to discover and I'm blown away by is the role and importance of sleep in every aspect of our lives. There is no aspect of our lives that isn't touched by sleep. Mental health, cognitive ability, organ health, motor learning, microbiome health, the expression of our DNA, rates of cardiovascular complication, cancer, you name it, anything that good or bad that can happen in your life is gonna be tied into the amount of sleep that you get. So if fitness and nutrition, um, mindfulness, <laughs> everything, social connection, everything that was on our list just now, if those are pillars in the strategy to improve the longevity of our lives, then sleep has to be considered the foundation upon which those pillars rest on. And what I've come to discover, it's through the mechanics of sleep that those pillars interact with one another. So how much sleep is enough? I did a little poll here, right? But we consider the fast pace in, in today's society. And um, is it safe to generalize that folks aren't getting eight to 10 hours of sleep? You go to the World Health Organization website and it says eight hours. You know, that's actually like the minimum. It's more like seven to eight, six to seven, six, maybe less. I put out a survey yesterday and I had 100 respondents. And just so you know that this survey went out to folks in the gym and, and alumni. So that, that's the, uh, the sample of people that we're working with. And I'll just bring up the results here of that survey. There we are right there. So eight to 10 hours of sleep, 14%. Holy moly, who is that? <laughs> seven to eight hours, 37%. But here's our biggest percentage right there, six to seven hours. And then 10% of my respondents six hours or less. So once again, when you consider the sample of the population here, these are folks that you know, are interested in improving their lives. What if we went outside of our gym here and sampled the general population altogether? We'd probably be seeing a lot more in here and a lot more in here. Just give me a second, I'm gonna flip back to our screen. Perfect, so sleep researchers in the last 10 to 15 years have been able to make some astounding discoveries. The tools that are available from the MRI to diagnostic tools that measure every electrical impulse that's running through our bodies and our brains while we're asleep and while we're awake, they've been able to come up with a mountain of evidence that shows the detriment of shortchanging our sleep that is getting in to that six to seven hour range and less. So I wanna just give you a little taste of some of that research, okay? Um, okay, let's take a perfectly healthy person. They're getting that eight to 10 hours of sleep. All of a sudden, we're gonna restrict them. Seven hours of sleep, that's it. And you're probably, luxury, seven hours. So let's take that person, seven hours of sleep. In 10 days, that person will register the same sort of cognitive impairments as a person that's just gone 24 hours without sleep. Interesting. Next, let's take a perfectly healthy individual. They go to a, a doctor, every biomarker that they've got, the doctor's like, holy smokes, this guy's gonna live for 100 years, he's so healthy. That person's getting an eight hour sleep. All of a sudden, let's put them on a severe sleep diet, four hours only, for six nights. That person will have the same blood sugar as a pre-diabetic. Crazy. Here's an interesting one. There are more traffic fatalities as a result of drowsy sleeping than alcohol and drug-related car accidents combined. And those are the reported ones too. As a matter of fact, a person 
that has gone 19 hours without sleep will have the same cognitive impairments as a person that blows 0.08 on alcohol breathalyzer test. Combine that with being drowsy and we've got a real combination for a serious accident. A lifetime of a short sleep, six to seven hours, is a key indicator as to whether a person will develop Alzheimer's disease or not. Sleep deprivation is so disastrous, the Guinness Book of World Records said, holy shit, we gotta stop doing this, we're gonna kill somebody. They abolished the record, they don't want anybody to try and do it anymore. So bad that they went back into their old volumes and deleted the record. Sleep deprivation is also a highly effective uh, torture method. Countries such as Pakistan, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Turkey, oh, and the United States, all employ sleep deprivation as a torture method. Why? It leaves no marks. Okay, that's pretty grim stuff. <laughs> oh, sorry, let me get caught up here. Okay, pretty grim stuff. Now, my intent there is not to scare, it's more to gently startle you, to make you curious about the mountain of evidence that exists out there that shows you how detrimental it is to do a lifetime of short sleep and even short sleep on a short-term basis. And shortly I'll be talking about ways that we can maximize our opportunities for getting more sleep and better quality sleep, but first we need to take a look at sleep at the cellular level. Okay, let's take that person that is consistently shortchanging their sleep. They are in effect performing blunt force genetic engineering on themselves. So what I mean by that, that short sleep is going to affect the ability of DNA to express in the body. For example, one of your cells might be responsible for producing an enzyme that helps you digest a protein. Or you have another cell that's responsible for adding pigmentation to your hair as it leaves the hair follicle, okay? So when you shortchange your sleep, the negative effect on our DNA expression is twofold. One there's going to be an increase in the expression of cells that are responsible for triggering inflammation and cell stress. And then on the other side of the coin, there will be a diminished expression from those cells responsible for maintaining a stable metabolism, optimal immune response, and cholesterol regulation. So on top of messing around with your DNA being able to do its job, that short sleep is also quite possibly affecting or physically damage the structure of the cell itself. Let's go back to grade school, shall we? Remember that, grade six? Okay, so there's our cell. We got the cell membrane, the cytoplasm, some ribosomes and centrioles floating around in there. There's the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, and right there in the middle, we have the nucleus. Okay, let's zoom in on that nucleus, and there's our DNA swirling around in there. We take a strand of DNA, it combines with proteins, it compresses down, and then it binds with another strand of DNA, and it forms a chromosome. So these chromosomes are subject to damage. They could either uh, fray and fuse with nearby uh, chromosomes, or the DNA itself might actually become damaged. Now, two things can occur when this happens. One, that cell will become senescent, which means it stops replicating, it sends out SOS signals instead. Or that cell with the damaged DNA does manage to duplicate. So what happens? Well, for one, that cell might stop doing its job. So that cell that was responsible for producing the enzyme to help you digest protein, it's not working anymore. That cell that was adding a pigmentation to your hair, it's not working anymore, so your hair remains white as it comes out of the hair follicle. <laughs> in either case, a senescent cell or damaged cell, we are opening up the door for a host of disease to now set in, okay? So the crucial job of protecting our chromosomes falls on a structure on the chromosome that you are going to want to become very familiar with, okay? The name of the structure is called a telomere. The telomere caps the chromosome. It's much like the egglet that's on the end of your shoelace to keep your shoelace from damage and from fraying and falling apart. Now here's the thing. The longer the telomere, the longer that cell has to live. The telomere could very well be the key 
biomarker or indicator that tells us how long that cell has to live and consequently how long we might have to live or when we might have a disease. Make sense? Okay. Now here's the problem. When a cell replicates or if that cell is subject to stress, environmental stress or stress from in ourselves, those telomeres get shorter. Okay, we could take two individuals, age 45, and we could stand them together side by side. <laughs> and we could take these two individuals side by side. One of these 45 year olds is going to look young. Okay, the other one is going to look older, like 55, pretty haggard looking. We could draw a blood sample from both of these individuals and we can actually have their telomeres measured. And so it would be no surprise that the younger looking person is going to have longer telomeres, whereas the older looking person is going to have shorter telomeres and could very well be on their way to a disease. Okay, so <laughs> if we shorten our sleep, then that is a stress on the body. And that shortened sleep and that shortened sleep could mean a shortened life. Shorten our sleep, shorten our life. So, why does a shortened telomere, or sorry, why does a shortened sleep result in shortened telomeres? We have evolution to thank for this. Okay. If, you see, a short sleep is a stress or a threat. And if a, a stress or a threat is perceived, then we have an older limbic brain system that will respond to its stress. It will do what it has been programmed to do for hundreds of thousands of years, if not longer. And that is prepare the body for fight or flight. When that stress or threat is perceived, the sympathetic nervous system, it's gonna get fired up. There's gonna be a shot of cortisol, a rush of adrenaline, here's a little epinephrine for you. There'll be an increased heart rate, increase in blood pressure, shortness of breath. The immune system is gonna fire up the inflammation system to prepare the body for a contusion or bite or a broken bone. Let's refer to this older limbic system that responds to stress as the inner gorilla. I'm sorry, that's the wrong gorilla? That's Mike Perrier? <laughs> There we go, there's our inner gorilla. If we let our uh, reactions to stress go unchecked and let the inner gorilla constantly run the show, then we could experience uh, a breakdown of that sympathetic nervous system. A person will experience adrenal fatigue, a sense of always being tired. Um, there'll be chronic inflammation and perhaps pain from that chronic inflammation. In short, it's going to result in a lot of stress on those telomeres. So, times have changed, and so have our brains. About 70,000 years ago, humans, Homo sapiens, underwent the cognitive revolution. And the whole upstart of the cognitive revolution was a massive advantage over our neighbors, the Homo erectus, Neanderthal, not to mention every single species on the planet. And what happened during that cognitive revolution is that humans began to develop and refine their prefrontal cortex. Now the whole upstart of that prefrontal cortex is now humans, they were now able to have rational thought. They were able to conceive of an idea and communicate that concept to another human being who was then able to grasp that concept without even seeing it in real life. They began to develop an emotional IQ they began to develop morality. But most importantly, this development of the prefrontal cortex gave humans the ability to manage emotion and manage thought. We'll refer to this newer brain system as the inner human. So, the opportunity to be hunted down and do battle with an apex predator nowadays has pretty much been reduced to zero. You you have to pay good money for an experience like that. Now to, on a, however, on a daily, if not by the minute basis, 
humans are having to do battle with their thoughts and their emotions. So sitting between the inner human and within the limbic brain system of the old gorilla is a brain structure called the amygdala, okay? And one of the jobs of the amygdala is to process emotions. So if emotions such as anger, grief, shame, jealousy, bitterness, judgment, insecurity, or any other of the fear-based emotions are perceived by the amygdala, what's one of the options? Let's pick up the phone to the inner gorilla to handle the situation, and then he'll come crashing in, and all of the, the physical, physical and mental duress that comes along with it. That inner gorilla is a reaction to stress. So, the term mindfulness has been around for a long time. We often associate it with Eastern religions. And I mean, but nowadays you could pick up your phone, go to the app store, and choose from dozens, if not a hundred different apps that will help you with the practice of mindfulness. And you might be saying, Tom, it's a bunch of bullshit, I don't need that. And you know what, I used to think the same thing myself. But then I started looking at it. I took a different approach. I was reading works of Buddhism. I was reading the works of the Dalai Lama. I was doing yoga, I was doing meditation. I was trying to pry open my third eye. But I became disenchanted with it. Probably much the same way I became disenchanted with the Catholic Church when I became an adult. No offense to any Catholics here. <laughs> um, so I decided, or I discovered more, I should say, a more scientific, a more physiological approach to mindfulness. So if I want to improve a muscle group or if I want to improve an energy system, I need to subject my body to a good stress framed as a challenge. And then I need to rest, okay? I do that enough and over time, my muscles are gonna get better, my energy systems are gonna get better and I'll be prepared for just about any physical situation that might come my way. Like sprinting for a connecting flight that's on the other side of a terminal and it's leaving in five minutes and every sign is in a language that I don't understand. So just as I need to improve my physical muscles, I also need to improve my mindfulness muscle. So what do I mean by that? It means that when I am faced with a stressful situation, such as sprinting for that connecting flight or about to have an argument with someone I love, I have two options. I could either react with the inner gorilla or I could pause, put some distance between the inner gorilla and the inner human, and let the inner human do some work. Remember that gorilla is a reaction to stress, and the inner human is a response to stress. I ask you this, if the red lights are flashing, and the next thing that you are about to say to the love of your life is either going to wind up in a two-day full argument, or a constructive conversation that's gonna improve the relationship, who would you rather have in charge of the situation? A stressed out, fear-based, adrenaline-fueled animal, or someone acting out of love? Either way, lives are gonna be changed. To bring out the inner human in more, if not every moment of our lives, is going to drastically reduce our stress and all the physical and mental duress that comes along with it. But this is going to take practice. We're gonna do this. We're gonna do a one minute mindfulness exercise together right now. So we've been going for about 20 minutes here. Just shift around in your seats here, make sure that you're comfortable. And this is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna be taking in a breath. We're gonna inhale for five seconds, we're gonna hold for three seconds, and then we're gonna exhale for seven seconds. It's a 15 second breath. We're going to do it four times, so that will be a whole minute. When I get you guys started, I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes. Now, it's only natural thoughts are gonna pop into your head, okay? The exercise is not to keep the thoughts out of our head. The idea is to let the thoughts come, but not attach an emotion, and do not attach a story to those thoughts. Okay? Merely acknowledge them. Maybe apply a tag. Thinking, thinking, thinking. And then return to the breath. Okay? 
Nothing too serious today. Are you guys ready to go? Everybody seated comfortably? Okay. Close your eyes and we'll take that first inhale. Inhale, two, three, four, five. Hold, two, three. Exhale, three, four, five, six, seven. Inhale, two, three, four, five. Hold, two, three. Exhale, three, four, five, six, seven. Inhale, two, three, four, five. Hold, two, three. Exhale, three, four, five, six, seven. Inhale, two, three, four, five. Hold, two, three. Exhale, three, four, five, six, seven. And bring your breath back to normal and open your eyes. Did anybody see God? <laughs> In its most basic, guys, that is essentially mindfulness. To be of aware of our emotions, to be aware of our thoughts and have the ability to manage that emotion. Will the gorilla react to that thought or emotion or will the human respond to that emotion? So the next time you have a stressful situation that's coming up, for example, maybe it's your first uh, CrossFit uh, workout, your CrossFit Games workout or Cross uh, Can West Games workout or maybe you have a looming deadline, or maybe you have a presentation tomorrow, or maybe something real sudden happens, like someone cuts you off in the middle of, of traffic. Instead of reacting to the situation, just take a second, do a couple of those mindful breaths and see where that takes you. So here's something really cool. There is um, a Nobel Prize winner by the name of Emily Blackburn, and um, she is a pioneer basically in the research on telomeres. And she wanted to do an experiment where we, she took a group of people and put them into a retreat, uh, a meditation retreat. So she measured their telomeres before they got started, and then they went to this mindfulness retreat, ate right, did some exercise, and uh, worked on their stress reduction. And when, when, re when they returned, she measured their telomeres, and lo and behold, the telomeres were longer. So what was going on there when we're able to manage our stress, the body is going to start to produce an enzyme, a ribonuclear protein called telomerase, that then adds itself to that telomere. So whether that reverses the aging process and makes us younger, not 100%, but it does increase the life of that, of that cell. So that's pretty cool right there. Okay, so, whoops, almost there. Let's get back to sleep. Okay, so uh, we're going to take a quick look at how sleep affects our fitness and how fitness affects our sleep. We'll do a real quick touch on nutrition and how nutrition affects sleep and the other way around. But we need to get through a couple of technicals on sleep so it all makes sense. First is a sleep cycle. Our sleep cycle is 90 minutes in length. When we fall asleep, we drop down into non rat Non-REM sleep, rapid eye movement, non-REM sleep stages one and two. Then we go deeper into non-REM sleep stages three and four, and then we come up a little bit, and then we have REM sleep. And if we're doing it right, we're gonna go through about five or six cycles of that in a night. Now here's, what something, here's something cool, is that at the beginning of the night, there is more non-REM sleep, and then as the night goes on and we get closer to morning, we have more REM sleep. It is mind-blowing what is going on with our brains and our bodies during these different stages of sleep, but for today's purposes, we'll simplify it. Non-REM sleep is largely responsible for repair and maintenance to the body and to the brain. It's also at this time, and this is really, really cool, that the brain is running diagnostics or analytics on our brain. It's like, what are the neural pathways that are getting the most use throughout the course of the day and yesterday and what is, most important per, what is most important to this person? And if it's deemed important and if it's getting a lot of use, it's going to reinforce those neural networks with something called myelin. Think about your double unders when you first came here. Impossible to get, right? But with time, with that motor practice and with sleep, those, uh, that reinforcement of the neural networks reinforced. And it's like, I've been doing it all my life. So if you're still at that stage where you don't quite have your double unders, maybe before you go to sleep tonight, just tell yourself, this is really important to me. 
<laughs> All right, and then maybe some magic will happen, and on Monday you're just going to be cruising right along here. Uh, also, during uh, non-REM sleep, uh, we have the, the transfer of data, of short-term, uh, of memories from the short-term parts of our brain, like the hippocampus, to longer-term storage. So that's our non-REM. In our REM sleep, guys, this is where we have the integration of connections between what did we learn today and what have we known in the past. So the brain during REM sleep is looking for the craziest connections possible. It's also during REM sleep that we dream. And it's been theorized that dreams are just a side effect of all these crazy interconnections that our brains are making between the new stuff and the old stuff. REM sleep is also crucial for our emotional IQ. It's crucial for our moods. How happy are you if you wake up uh, too early in the morning? That's when all our REM sleep is taking place. But most important, that REM sleep gives us better access to all the abilities of that inner human and the functions of our prefrontal cortex. Okay, so there's our technicals there. Let's start getting in to what happens when we work out, what happens to our sleep, okay? So when we work out on a regular basis, we fall asleep sooner, bonus. Two, when we are working out as a part of our habits is we get better non-REM sleep. So what do I mean by that? Researchers are, um, took a group of people that weren't working out. When we fall asleep um, in our non-REM sleep, there's a strong signal that starts from the front of our brain and works to the back. When we're awake or we're in REM sleep, there's chatter coming from all over the brain. But in non-REM sleep, when that signal starts, every single part of our brain falls into sync with that signal. The stronger the signal, the better quality non-REM sleep a person is going to have. What was very cool is they took that group once they discovered that non-REM sleep got better, but the group that was most affected by exercise was middle-aged people and seniors. It was far more pronounced, the improvements in that signal in that age group. It might be easy to say, seniors, they don't need, they don't need to sleep. You don't need to sleep when you're old. That's complete bullshit. Uh, old people, seniors, need as much sleep as a child does, but they simply don't have that physical ability to generate that strong signal for sleep. So exercise is a great option to help out seniors with their sleeping. Um, here's something cool. Back to our sleep cycle. After we go through one of those 90-minute cycles, the body enters an anabolic state. Anabolic? Like steroids? Yeah, kind of. In that anabolic state, the, the body is going to start to produce testosterone and human growth hormone, HGH, which will then process proteins, repair muscle, and build up that muscle for us. Also, while we sleep, the body is hard at work in non-REM sleep to alleviate the inflammation, the local inflammation that occurred as a result of working out. Uh, it's also going to start to stock up those cells with uh, glucose and glycogen in anticipation of tomorrow's energy requirements. A lot of cool stuff happening there when we work out, when we sleep. So let's go the other way. Let's take our group of people. They're getting eight hours of sleep, eight to 10 hours of sleep. They're working out and then all of a sudden, sorry folks, we're putting you on a sleep diet, okay? You're down to your six hours of sleep, and that's it. Here's what happens to physical performance as a result. First, time to physical exhaustion drops 10 to 30%. That sucks. 30% <laughs> off the top of your performance. Next, aerobic output is significantly reduced. Three, impairments in the generation of force. That big deadlift that you got last week, not happening this week. You can't pull it off the ground. Four, decreases in peak and sustained muscle strength. This is a two-pager, folks. Five, faster rates of lactic acid buildup. Two, reduction of blood oxygen saturation. Three, a diminished ability of the body to cool itself. And this one should come as no surprise. If you're not getting enough non-REM sleep, your body's losing opportunities to repair itself. Da, 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 da. Increased probability of injury. All right. If you haven't heard stress, a good stress framed as a challenge, plus rest 
equals growth. Good stress plus too much more good stress plus bad stress plus not enough rest equals a stalled out athlete stuck on a plateau wondering how they're going to improve their performance. So if you have a big competition coming up like the CanWest Games, maybe you have a big race coming up, or simply you want to maximize your performance, you have to work sleep and rest into your training program. Simple as that. Now here's a cool story. Does everybody know who Roger Bannister is? Okay, Roger Bannister is the first human being to ever record a sub four minute mile in running. This happened in 1954 at the Commonwealth Games right here in Vancouver at the old Empire Stadium. Now people were trying for a long time to break that four minute mile, but it wasn't happening and some people were like, can't be done. So in the lead up to the Commonwealth Games, Roger Bannister was training just as hard as everybody else that he was going to be competing against. But then a few weeks before the Commonwealth Games, he's like, I'm out of here. I'm going for a two week vacation in Scotland. And everybody's like, what are you doing, man? You should be training. So it can only be assumed that Roger Bannister was getting plenty of good rest and sleep while he was on vacation. Then he comes to Vancouver before the event, puts in some light training, and then history was made. So was the mystery of the sub four minute mile solved by rest and sleep? I urge you to conduct the experiment on yourself. Quick look at nutrition and I should say, how we eat and our sleep. Oh, there's that stress plus rest equals growth, guys. <laughs> I really want to enforce that there. Okay. Okay, some quick things. How does how we eat affect how we sleep? Fasting will keep you awake. Okay, intermittent fasting, I'm not talking about that. The jury's still out on that as far as the research is concerned. But if you're fasting for a day or two days, you're not going to get as much sleep. Why? Well, that's, that's a stress. And the inner gorilla is like, we ain't sleeping until there's some more food in this place. Makes sense. Next, calorie restriction. And I'm not talking just a little bit, but if you're like a human being needs 1,800, 2,000 calories a day, if they cut that in half, that too is a stress and it also results in lower quality non-REM sleep, that signal that I was describing earlier. A high carb, low fat diet as well decrease the quality of that non-REM sleep a person gets. A diet high in sugar but low in fiber is going to result in fragmented sleep and it's also going to again affect that quality non-REM sleep. All right, so going the other way, how does sleep affect how we eat. One big one is a hormone imbalance, uh, ghrelin and leptin. These two things tell us when we're hungry and when we should keep eating. If you are shorting your sleep, there's going to be imbalance. There's going to be more ghrelin present in your system and there will be that perception that you're not hungry. So a person not getting enough sleep very well could be overeating. And the other thing, um, if we are shortchanging that REM sleep, if we're waking up too early, then we're losing that, all the abilities that come, that access that comes from the prefrontal cortex and the inner human. And part of that is managing emotions, managing our thoughts, and managing our impulses. So not enough sleep or, or cutting into our REM sleep, then you could become an impulsive eater. And at the gas station paying for your gas, you're like, oh, Reese's peanut butter cups. I'll take three, please. <laughs> All right, so that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to uh, nutrition and sleep. Uh, Leah, on April 17th, is going to be taking a far deeper dive into the world of uh, nutrition. She's going to be running a six-week um, six workshop. workshop, thank you. Yes, workshop. Uh, she's going to be getting more into nutrition, stress reduction, and how to make some simple habit changes in our lives that will make everything better. Okay, we're on the home stretch now, guys. We're going to now discuss how we can increase our opportunities for more and better sleep. We need to first be aware of three major influences in our life that determines when we fall asleep and when we wake up. And the first big thing is our circadian rhythm. Okay, the circadian rhythm is a nearly perfect 24 hour clock that's running in our minds, in our brains, and it can run independent of sunlight. 
early sleep researchers, actually the same researchers that discovered REM sleep, put themselves in a cave where no sunlight could get in for 30 days and they kept meticulous logs of their sleep. And lo and behold, without the presence of sunlight, they were nearly 24 hours perfect with their circadian rhythm. Now the circadian rhythm is a signal. It gets loud about this time of day, run until about two o'clock, and then as the sun sets, that signal starts to get a little bit quieter and it's, it's a signal to the system to start shutting down for the night. But then as dawn approaches, that signal starts to get a little bit louder again and the body starts to wake up, the brain starts to wake up. Now working closely with our circadian rhythm is light. And I need to specify here blue light, okay, on our, on our, our light spectrum. Here we go, a little Pink Floyd, dark side of the moon. There's the sunlight hitting the prism, breaking up into our light spectrum, and there's blue light right there. Now, behind our eyes are our optic nerves. The optic nerves run to the back of our brains, to the visuospatial region. Halfway through our brains, those optic nerves, they crisscross, and sitting above the crisscross of those optic nerves is a structure called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. The job of this little structure is to sample blue light. So as the sun is starting to fade, day's coming down, the suprachiasmatic nucleus is going to detect that lack of blue light. It's going to send a signal to the penile gland saying, hey buddy, let's get some melatonin going here. We got to shut things down for the night. As dawn approaches and that blue light is returning, by the way, it could sample this even when your eyes are closed. It starts to get more blue light. It's like, penile gland, enough with the melatonin already. We got to wake up and get going for the day. I wanted to specify blue light because nowadays there is an awesome innovation that everybody is using right now, and unfortunately it's very confusing to our suprachiasmatic nucleus, and that is LED light. For the most part, LED light is running on or emitting blue light. So I want you to go home tonight and take inventory of the room that you chill out in and relax in before you go to bed. What kind of lighting is lighting that room? Is it LED light or do you still have the incandescent? Until the technology catches up and LED starts to work on that yellow spectrum, maybe it is time to go old school and put in those incandescent bulbs. How about that big TV you have that you're watching? LED? Yeah, blue light. Why can't you fall asleep when you're laying in bed? Maybe it has something to do with that phone or tablet that's six inches away from your eyes blasting blue light into your eyes. My wife will tell me, when I was rehearsing, she's like, you always have your phone in your face. Like, I know, I know. So maybe it's time to put that phone in another room at night and go old school, get an old clock there beside you. Okay, so there's another really big influence into how we fall asleep, and that is sleep pressure. And that comes in the form of adenosine, like adenosine triphosphate, the energy currency that our cells use to work. Yes, but I'm not going to get too into a too confusing uh, explanation of that. I really want to simplify this. We're going to go cartoon logic here, okay, when it comes to adenosine. I want you to picture your head, your skull, as a kitchen sink, and your brain is in that sink, all right? When we're awake, there's a plug in the bottom of that sink, and the adenosine builds up in that sink throughout the course of the day, and at some point, it becomes so overwhelming, we need to fall asleep. And when we fall asleep, the plug comes out of the sink and the adenosine starts to drain. We don't get enough sleep, the plug goes back in, and all of yesterday's adenosine that didn't drain, it's still there. And so here comes all of today's adenosine piling up on the adenosine that's already in there so that by 10.30, we're ready to go back to bed. But we have a solution for that, don't we? What is it? Right! Caffeine, the most widely used psychoactive drug in the world. We think it's so harmless, we'll give it to our kids. Caffeine doesn't wake you up. Caffeine is a joker. It's a masking agent. And here's how it works. Adenosine interacts with the receptor in our brains. We have a cup of coffee, and that caffeine molecule comes in and bumps that adenosine uh, out of the receptor, and it interacts with the receptor at this point. It's like, come on, brain, we got some work to do. Caffeine will stay in the system for about six hours. An enzyme produced by a liver called cytochrome scrubs the caffeine from the system. That's one of its jobs. You'd be like, come on, caffeine, get off that receptor already. The caffeine's like, no, I got one more episode of Grey's Anatomy to watch. <laughs> so the caffeine's out of the system, and what happens? 
Here comes the caffeine crash. All the adenosine that was rudely bumped out of the way in the first place and all the adenosine that came in after it comes rushing in and we're overwhelmed at that point. Have another cup of coffee if you want, but the only way to clear adenosine is by sleeping. You don't get enough, you're not gonna clear it. It's like trying to pay a maxed out credit card with the minimum balance every month. So, we have our three big influences. We got our circadian rhythm, we got the light, and we've got our sleep pressure. If we're doing it right and all three are working together, we're gonna to fall asleep at a good time, and we're all gonna wake up eight to 10 hours later, and life is gonna be awesome. So, right now I just wanna give you a little bit of sleep hygiene tips here. But uh, before all that, I do not want to undermine or make light of insomnia or people that feel that they have insomnia. There's some good news, okay? Uh, true insomnia is a physical problem with brain, with the brain itself. A lot of people that feel they have insomnia is usually anxiety or a poor relationship with that sleep. So if, if that's the case, I don't want you rushing for an Ambien or any other of those sedatives. Sedatives is not sleeping, okay? It's a huge industry too, it's, it's, it's horrible. Rather, if you feel that you have insomnia, I want you to seek out a cognitive behavior therapist that will help you change your perspective and your relationship with sleep. And I have some great news. If anybody does want to uh, speak with a cognitive behavior therapist, we have one in our membership here. So shoot me an email or talk to me later in confidence and I will give you their contact info, okay? Um, the next thing, if you think you have sleep apnea, or if you're not too sure if you have sleep apnea, talk to the person that you sleep with or who no longer wants to sleep with you because you snore, okay? <laughs> sleep apnea, what's happening there is the body actually stops breathing. <gasps> and that's a fragmented sleep. You're not getting a deep sleep. Doesn't seem like a big deal, but what if that's happening 20 to 30 times an hour? Crazy. Across the lower mainland are a number of sleep clinics. And so just put the ego aside, go to a sleep clinic, get, get tested, and they will be able to give you a treatment that's non-invasive, non-intrusive, and it will literally change your life. Okay, so those are the two biggies, guys. Here's things that you could start doing today, tonight. I mentioned alcohol cessation at the beginning as one of our pillars, and we'll, we'll be talking about that again in the future. But in the meantime, uh, avoid alcohol. Uh, yes, especially at night. And you're like, well, should I drink in the morning then? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, when it comes to sleep, yes. Uh, but <laughs> no, don't take that advice. Um, here's the big thing with alcohol in sleep. Alcohol is the major suppressor of REM sleep, okay? But you might say, Tom, uh, you know, alcohol or a glass of alcohol, it helps me relax, it helps me fall asleep. It, it, it doesn't. Remember, alcohol is a depressant. It's a sedative. And once again, being sedated is not being asleep. I said it suppresses your REM sleep. And remember, if you're not getting enough REM sleep, it's going to affect your mood, it's going to affect your emotional IQ, and it's going to affect your ability to manage your emotions. So just keep that in mind when it comes to alcohol and sleep. Let's make this a rule. The bed is for sleep and sex only. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> In that order? In that order? Sleep and sex. <laughs> Whatever works, Mike. Like, I mean, yeah, any sex is, I'll take it. <laughs> Wake up. Okay. <laughs> Um, make the bedroom as dark as possible. So check the room that you chill out in at night to relax. Check out the bedroom as well. Any LED lights present, uh, swap them out for incandescent. Make sure uh, if you've got to put blackout blinds on, make the bedroom as, bark, bark, as dark as possible. Okay, your body needs to drop, your core temperature needs to drop one degree Celsius in order to fall asleep. So keep this in mind. Your head, your hands, and your feet are massive heat sinks for transferring heat from your core to the atmosphere around you. Try to avoid exercise about two hours before going to bed because as we all know here, when we get that, when we work out, our, our core temperature gets jacked, needs about two hours to come down. If you're having trouble falling asleep, have a hot bath before going to bed because that heat in the bath is going to draw the blood, the heat closer to the epidermis. When you get out of the tub, you're just going to be one mass of heat sink, get to bed. 
Next, go to bed at the same time every night. And yes, that includes weekends. Shitty, I know. Next, if you find yourself lying awake in bed and you can't get back to sleep, gently get yourself out of bed and go do something that doesn't require a whole lot of cognitive ability. Why? Well, we've all been there, right? We're tossing and turning, we can't get back to sleep. We check the clock and we're like, man, I gotta get up in a few hours. Tomorrow's a big day at work. I have a presentation to do. And in comes the inner gorilla saying, we need some adrenaline on this situation. <laughs> Enough said. Here's an easy one, or maybe it's not. Avoid the innocent nap on the couch in the evening. If you're sitting there watching TV and you're starting to get the nods and it's only eight o'clock, try to wake up, don't have a cup of coffee, try to wake up and see if you can stay awake. Um, reason being is when you do eventually wake up, go to bed, um, you're going to just find it that much more difficulty falling asleep and you're going to lose some of that sleep pressure as well. And then here's, here's my last one guys, is avoid caffeine within six hours of going to bed. Um, and don't forget, caffeine still exists in decaf and in dark chocolate and in ice cream and other delicious things that I like to have at night as well. <laughs> so with that guys, you might be saying, Geez, Tom, what's with the austerity measures, man? I gotta go to bed early, even on weekends. I gotta lay off the caffeine. I gotta lay off the booze. I gotta work out. I gotta do mindfulness. I gotta, I gotta eat right. Oh, where's the fun in all of that? And, and you know what? Maybe you're right. But <laughs> that just could be your inner gorilla talking, right? Your inner gorilla has a lot of difficulty seeing beyond the short term. Your inner gorilla has a lot of difficulty thinking about you 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. A word that means an awful lot to me is freedom. Uh, freedom to do the work I love to do. Freedom to be with people I wanna be around. Freedom to try out new sports in middle age because my body can take a couple of bumps and bruises. Freedom from disease and freedom from pain. I've got that freedom now, and I want to make sure 92-year-old Tom can still experience that freedom as well. It scares the crap out of me to, to think about all of a sudden being struck by a disease and losing that freedom, and even worse, becoming a burden on, on my family. And so, no, I don't think of these as austerity measures. I think of them as an act of love for myself and for all the people that are important in my life, and that includes all of you. I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, it's our 10 year anniversary here at Rocky Point, and we have come such a long way from trying to just like not puke in a garage while we're working out to <laughs> really developing things to be of better service to our members. Uh, it's not just myself. Uh, every week, uh, Errol and the coaches and I, we get together and we talk about how do we make things better for our members. And uh, so we are constantly improving and trying to develop better programs for everybody. And you're going to start to see some of that in the near future. Uh, if you wanted to talk to any of the coaches today, if you want to talk to Leah about her workshop that's coming up on April 17th, we're all going to stick around here for a little bit. And if you have any questions, all the coaches are here, and I'm going to be here for a few more min minutes as well if you wanted to, to ask me anything. So that's it for the talk today, guys. Thank you so much for giving me an hour of your Saturday. Thank you very much. <laughs>